What's that tweet again? Oh, it was about that sad case where like a two-year-old had a fatal alligator accident in Disney World, but this woman tweeted, I'm so finished with a white man's entitlement lately that I'm really not sad about a two-year-old being eaten by a gator because his daddy ignored signs. <laughs> and it's like, just... <laughs> it's amazing. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. It's actually it's, such it's, a good tweet. It's the perfect tweet. Twitter should have been shut down after that tweet. Without it, I could, you, I might have spent six more months thinking the internet was good. I'm John Favreau. Welcome to Offline. This week, my guest is Gia Tolentino. Gia is a staff writer at The New Yorker who wrote the book Trick Mirror in 2019. It's a collection of essays that became a New York Times bestseller and landed on just about every best of list, including Barack Obama's. Her first essay, The Eye and the Internet, is my favorite and the first thing I read when I thought about doing the show. She also just co-wrote an episode of BJ Novak's new TV show, The Premise, in which a young woman becomes obsessed with a nasty anonymous commenter. It's great. You should check it out. Here's Gia Tolentino. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, thanks for having me. I have to say, I, I feel, I don't know if you feel like this after a year of baby in the house, but I'm like, I've never been dumber, so we'll see how this goes, you know? <laughs> I, feel, I feel like that all the time. Yeah. <laughs> it's baby in the house and it's pandemic, and it's like, do I still know how to articulate a thought? Can I, do I just like scroll through Twitter all day? Well, you don't, which we're gonna talk about, but. Um, well, I'm relieved that you're still feeling that too. Yeah, it's, it's funny that for the rest of our lives, we will not be able to untangle the sort of mental de like decrepitude of early parenthood from the mental decrepitude of the pandemic, you know? Yes, that Emily and I talked about that all Or just like all of all the general things. The yeah. time. <laughs> like, we're like, was this the pandemic or was this being new parents? And yeah, like, like we which did feel accelerated my personal way. lameness Yeah, by <laughs> yes. like several hundred years. It's hard to say. It is, it's tough. <laughs> um, so I, I wanted to do this show because uh, I feel like we are still collectively underestimating the extent to which our extremely online existence is making it that much harder to solve the world's problems. Um, and you are the first person that I wanted to talk to for this show uh, because you wrote what I consider to be the definitive piece about the internet breaking our brains, uh, a 2019 essay called The Eye and the Internet, which appears in Trick Mirror, one of my all-time favorite books. Um, and there's a great part where you write about coming of age with the internet, uh, which I did too. Uh, and and you talked about how it started off fun and cool and promising. Do you remember what you liked about the internet back then? Yeah, I do. I really do. What I liked about it was that was that there was an active sense of discovery and surprise and mm -hmm. of and of a sort of limited sense of community. Like there was a way that you could find yourself within groups of people that corresponded to the way that socialization works in real life, which is like, like everything was bounded and, and everything was surprising. And the things that I looked at on the internet were completely different from the things that my parents would look at or my little brother or anyone else. And it was like this sense of wandering into kind of like a secret but ever expanding neighborhood every day. The first time I was employed to be on the internet, it was, I guess it was 2012 and I was blogging. Mm -hmm. And me and me and my friend Emma, we ran a blog called The Hairpin. And every morning we would, even till then, we would be combing through our separate sort of Google reader, you know, RSS feeds, which feel so antiquated now. But we, Emma and I have very similar interests. We're very similar people and personality and whatever. and. 85% of what we saw was different from the other person. Yeah. And now if we, Emma and I got on the internet at the same time, we would see 95% of the same thing. Yeah, I was, I was, I don't know what you were like as, as a kid, but I was always very social. And I can remember, you know, getting on the internet when I was in high school and then in college, there was instant messenger. And that was a great way in college to sort of connect with other friends. And I just took to it immediately because of connection you know the connection it offered sort of in the best sense of the word it's now a very different <laughs> sense of the word we talk about it today you know i don't want to make the mistake of you know where you think that the music that you listen to in adolescence and early adulthood was is the best music of all time right like i don't want to think that that internet was but there but the time in which we came of age does line up with a particular point in the internet you know 
college, whatever, the internet was trying to take all of the normal things that are pleasurable about making friends and, and just sharpen it and make it more specific and make it more like here are the people that you actually wish you were hanging out with in real life, right? It wasn't, I'm going to have more and more people look at me until the end of time, which is now the underlying sort of like algorithmic and economic driver of every social interaction on the internet. And I think the shift from, you know, I'm going to join X Facebook group and meet someone else that also like loves Cigarros and Chipotle, you know, and but, but the change between that and I am going to continually broadcast myself for an ever increasing number of strangers. Like it's, they're, they're completely worlds apart. Like one is sort of serving kind of inherent human desires to be loved and be seen and to love other people. And the other one is just exploiting it to the, you know, to the full extent possible. Right. Yeah. I, I'm just trying to figure out when it, when it actually shifted, you know, I mean, I, I think about it in terms of my career and I was on the Obama campaign in 2008 and the internet was awesome, right? We were yeah. organizing on online and it helped us win the race and everything was great. And I even think, but by the time we did the reelect in 2012 and, and maybe it's Twitter, maybe, maybe it was just sort of like social media taking hold more that I even think by 2012, it started feeling bad. Mm hmm. Is that when when did you get to the point where you were like this is actually so bad that I think I want to write an essay on this? <laughs> well, I so I did the Peace Corps in 2010 to 2011. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't have internet for an entire year and change and I was in this little village in the middle of the no in middle of nowhere just dying to use the internet, right? I didn't have it and all I wanted to do was send 5,000 word emails to my friends, you know, or Yeah whatever, or like look at Wikipedia, you know, like I, I was just, I missed the internet. And, and then I came back to it and it had already accelerated like the pace of conversation about it and the, the, the emotional tone of it terrified me, you know, after, after, you know, however many months in the middle of nowhere. And then in 2012, that's right, I'd started working for The Hairpin and other people that I worked with, they were always like, man, you know, the inner, like, there was just like another day on this cursed, you know, like, <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking about? The internet's amazing. I still found it really fun, but every day they would talk about how awful it was. And, and then within about a year, I, I got it. I was like, oh. <laughs> I mean, I've tried for a really long time to, and I think it's possible to really try to only use the internet in ways that are fun to you. I still tried to do that and succeeded to a, a significant extent, but you know, there, Alex Balk, who I used to work with, he wrote something way back, maybe 2013 or something. He has like two laws of the internet and I forget, like one of them is it will only ever get worse from here. You know, the thing that you think is bad about the internet right now will look like fucking Shakespeare in a decade, you know? <laughs> and, and it's true. Yeah, I mean, so, well, the crux of your argument, right, is that all of us being on the internet all of the time forces everyone to be constantly communicating in a way that makes us look good. Um, and you equate that to an endless performance with no backstage, which I love. Can you talk about uh, what you mean by that? Yeah, so I, you know, it's this, like Irving Goffman, his his sort of sociological framework for the way that performance enters into everyday life. It's just like, you know, when we're paying for something at the store, we are performing nice customer. When we are at work, we're performing this person at work. When we're with our our friends, you know, and, and it's like situation to situation, the audience changes over. And also essential to this performance idea is that at the end of the day, you get to go home and you're backstage, right? You're, it's yeah. the, the, the feeling of relief that anyone who's ever been on stage, it's like you get back off, you, you know, you get off stage, you breathe a sigh of relief and then you're truly, truly yourself or whatever that is. And the, the economic incentives of social media are such that there is no context changeover, right? And this has been something that's written about for decades and that, you know, if you are obeying the incentives of what these 
platforms hope you do, you are performing an increasingly attractive version of yourself so that more and more people will stream into the auditorium. And eventually that audit- auditorium goes for the, you know, 500 acquaintances that it's normal for people to have in their life to 1,000 to 2,000 to 3,000 to if you're very, if you're incredibly lucky slash incredibly unlucky, millions, right? Mm-hmm. And and it's like humans, we're not meant to live like this. Sorry, but you can probably hear this ambulance. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm on the, I'm in a ground floor apartment right next to a hospital. Um, yeah, it's like we're not we're not meant to live like that. We're not we're not meant to live in a realm where, you know, the the obviously incredibly unhealthy mechanisms of celebrity of being visible to people that you don't know personally and that don't know you personally. This is what the internet makes sort of inherently desirable where existentially I think we are all understanding that it's inherently you know really corrosive it's also exhausting right <laughs> because like the more time that we are that we spend on the internet and on these platforms and you know like you said at, at the beginning it was sort of by choice because it was fun at this point you know it's like a prerequisite to like be a member of society that you're on a lot of these platforms and if so if we're on all these platforms all the time and we're performing this identity for the public all the time I just, like, what do you think that does to people? So we've gotten, like, a sort of unholy extended experiment in this over the last 18 months, right? And it has become quite unequivocally clear that, you know, to me, at least, that the things are that are truly satisfying are unmediated right like everything that is truly truly satisfying and pleasurable to me is unmediated yeah. a meal at a restaurant like a conversation face to face like dancing a protest being in the park i mean like not to make a really simplistic analogy but i do i have been thinking this whole pandemic about you know in the same way that it's like surveillance capitalism does to human desire and to love and to personality and to like impulse, like all it does to that what, you know, what coal mining does to a mountain, you know, under the strictures of surveillance capitalism, we are the raw material. And not just that, like our, our thoughts and our whims and the things we look up late at night and, you know, the, the things we search for on Google, like the, these, and our, and again, our desire to be seen and to be loved, like this is the coal that's being mined and we are the mountain and our heads are going to be taken off, you know? Like, I think, I think that, and again, I, I say this as someone that has benefited immensely from the internet and wouldn't have a career without it. Like I've benefited from it, you know, as much as really any person could. And I think that the the trap of the internet is that so much of its surface layer is built around sort of like individualizing affirmation mm. and the shadow layer underneath it, the one that makes money for other people and sometimes for us, if we're lucky, the shadow layer underneath it is built on deep depersonalization and sort of like existential strip mining. And I think well, that's the problem yeah. because we, we feel the one part of the dopamine, the, the surface level dopamine, but deep down and in the deadness in our eyes, <laughs> we, feel, <laughs> we feel the other part, you know? Yeah, I mean, you're right. Like you have the quick hit of like, oh, I got a bunch of RTs and likes and someone liked my photo and I got a fun comment, right? But or I can't even remember. just the stimulation. Like I haven't, yeah. I haven't used Twitter on, like I, I got off Twitter a year ago and I, I haven't been able to rid my brain. Like I, I, I instantly lost the need for like RTs and whatever. Like I'd been trying to talk myself out of that for years anyway, but I, I can't shake the desire for constant, like that dopamine, the basic like rat level dopamine. I can't get rid of it. It has nothing to do with personal affirmation. I just, my brain no, wants like new information every second of the day and I'm fucked. <laughs> I, I always wonder with myself if it has to do with like I'm always a I always had FOMO as a kid right like I I hated being late for school because I didn't want to miss class and my friends and I just Whoa. always needed to be connected yeah I always needed to be connected socially but I have found that sometimes when I'm not near my phone like fi- picking up my phone and figuring out what everyone's doing online meaning what's happening on Twitter has become like an equivalent to 
what are all my friends doing or what are my family yeah. doing like there is that hit you're right that doesn't necessarily have to do with affirmation but you're just like really interested in knowing what's going on in the world but well like, and, and also like you have a professional like somewhat of a professional requirement to do that right i mean i yeah. i think if i was still blogging i would have to be you know if i were still editing i would have to be on the internet it's and it's hard to i mean and, and that's always how it is it's like there's the there's the sort of like you know, the, the sort of neurological compulsive, you know, dopamine incentives. And then there are the real professional or paraprofessional needs. Yeah. Well, let, let's talk about the professional side of it, because there's what it does to us individually. And there's also sort of what it does to society. I mean, one reason I found the essay so compelling is that every time you identified a different problem with the Internet, I think like, oh, this isn't just why the internet sucks. This is why politics sucks right now. Huh, yeah. Um, so for example, you know, you point out that the internet encourages us to overvalue our opinions, uh, which cuts deep because I, I offer opinions about politics. Same. For a I living. mean, well, but same. That was my whole job. Just, but I was right? like, it it's, doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> but it's it's something I wrestle with all the time because on one hand, you want to believe that what you say and write can persuade at least some people to think a little differently or act a little differently. On the other, it can be tempting to think that tweeting a political take is a substitute for action and, and grassroots organizing, which is obviously much tougher. Um, have you wrestled with that tension in, in your own writing? Yeah, I mean, and, and it's funny, like as a writer, I'm like, everything I do is fucking useless and I've never <laughs> liked anything I've done in my life. As a consumer, I'm like, there are so many writers whose work has clarified usefully things for me that have actually changed my material and active life. But I, yeah, I think that the internet, so again, I think this is another thing that's become especially unavoidably obvious in the pandemic is that the internet is, necessarily structured to value the representation of something over the thing itself, right? The representation of happiness, the representation of a sunset, the representation of action, representation of justice, of, you know, of the representation of equal representation. Like it's the same reason that we, like the conversations about diversity and representation get tied up so much in like film and TV and not in economics and not in actual sort of material empowerment. It does seem like we've, We've sort of lulled ourselves into the lulled ourselves into the belief that, you know, making statements about politics and politically righteous statements is um, is enough, or at least is something that can lead to, mm -hmm. or at least we overestimate how much that can lead to real social change. Do you do you think that too? Of course, and I think that to some extent we are the way we are on the internet because of like weakness and compulsion. To another, we are the way we are because. The same mechanisms and the same sort of stage of capitalism that we're at consumes, I think, more and more and more of people's days. And the internet steps into the 15 spare minutes that you might have commuting from one job to another or, you know, laying on your couch for five seconds before you get up to answer the next email. And it's like, okay, you don't have time to go to this community board meeting because you know, you can't, you can only afford childcare three days a week. You don't have time to go to the meeting. You don't have time to do this thing you wish you could do. And, but instead you can at least like tweet about it or like, you know. You can post, you can always post. You can, you can post, you can always post, you know? Yeah, yeah. I wonder if it makes it, it makes people think that civic action, political action is as easy as posting or going on the internet like it's like a security blanket you know like oh, okay well i don't have to it is hard to go to that protest to go to the march to do the organizing to go door to door and talk I, sometimes i think about the contrast between um you know i've knocked on doors for elections and like speaking to individual people and trying to persuade them to think differently or come along with you or, or take an action and it's it's a lot harder to do it one-on-one -on -one than to just yeah. hit hit tweet and then be like, well, that opinion was certainly correct. And I'm sure a bunch of people are going to be convinced by that. And so now I can just sit back and take it easy. Yeah. You know, I think many people want to be good and want to be civically active and want to be like just good citizens and good stewards of this tiny little speck of life that we have on the earth. But and, and, and the desire that goes into like, you know, I want to make sure that I am living a good life. It is really, really cleverly harnessed by the internet into like, I want to make sure that people know 
that I am good, you know? And then the difference between that is, is it's a chasm. It's an, un, it's an almost unbreachable chasm because it's like, you know, it's the idea that people are like, I want to stand for something, right? It's like, this is a real and valuable and genuine and important and often productive impulse. But the internet just like, you know, it just, it just drops a piano on it. You know, it's, it's just, it, it squashes it into like this to nothing, a little silhouette. It leads to, um, well, it leads to virtue signaling, right? The practice of virtue signaling that you are, that it's, it's, it's almost more important to communicate that you are good than to actually do the work of being a good person. Um, can you tell the alligator story that you brought up there? Cause it was just, that's like my favorite example. What's that tweet again? Oh, it was about that sad case where like a two year old had a fatal alligator accident in Disney world. But this woman tweeted, I'm so finished with a white man's entitlement lately that I'm really not sad about a two year old being eaten by a gator because his daddy ignored signs. <laughs> and it's like, <laughs> It's amazing. I mean, it's, it's beautiful. It's actually it's, such a good tweet. It's the perfect tweet. It's, it's a perfect have, tweet. Sh Twitter should have been shut down after that tweet. I'm so grateful for that tweet. It, it, <laughs> it, <laughs> without it, I could, you, I might have spent six more months thinking the internet was good. So like, I, I keep finding myself thinking like, what is the point of my engagement? Am I doing something? Am I fixing something? And I, I felt, especially over the last couple of years, that like the more time I spend on platforms like i might be knowing more about shit but um it, it's mm. not really changing anything yeah i remember I, I wrote about this for the new yorker in 2016 when it was like I remember remember that was the year that people were tweeting at the end of the year they were like me at the beginning of 2016 me at the end and it was like you know like a beautiful hummingbird and then like a crow clutching a bloody knife or whatever and and i remember then it seemed to me and i think i i still feel this that every year would only ever feel worse than the last one forever, as long as we were, <laughs> so, as long as we were spending more and more of our time on the internet. Because I think the condition of being on the internet, which increasingly feels like the, uh, the condition of contemporary life is that you can know an unlimited amount of information. And because of the same structures that produce the internet, our ability to actually change things, our margins of action and resistance will at best stay static and possibly, and certainly for a considerable swath of the population, perhaps shrink. Like, and it's like that condition of being able to know anything about anything, about anyone, you know, in like such intimate, like the intimate detail of a friend sending you a selfie while nothing changes or perhaps only gets worse in the actual, like it, there's, that's like a recipe for just absolute madness. And yeah, I mean, to me, my only, like I, I've been trying to, I've been writing about this for a while and I was like, oh, gee, you, you do have a, a modicum of agency, like you can do something about this. And I've like, and, but it's taken me, a, and like my only solution is like, be smooth brain, know very little about <laughs> to try to know as little as possible. And that's not actually true, but try to avoid the constant like barrage of things you can't do anything about directly except for like throw a little money at. And like try to know a little bit less about that stuff so that you have time to like use your actual time better. Yeah. And I think that's the only solution. <laughs> I mean, how has that how has that worked for you? during the pandemic? Cause I know that you- Like badly, like, cause we had a <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was wondering about your experience cause you, so you got off Twitter when? Uh, like at the beginning of the pandemic? I've been slowly, slowly, slowly trying to get off the internet. Like during the pandemic, I would get on for like 10 minutes a day. And I was like, this sucks. I miss my friends. <laughs> like I'd want to go out to dinner and stop listening to these fucking strangers, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and then I knew that after I had a baby, I would be, I would be up at all hours of the day and I would, I would be staring at a screen, you know, while I was like nursing her at all hours of the, of the day and night. And I was like, I, I can't spend this time on Twitter. Like I was longing for sort of like a, all of the things that come with a baby, but also the things that Twitter had made me hungry for, just like total ego death, like an absolute existential reset. Like I wanted a sort of psychedelic, absolute change in my life. But then 
but I, I got back on the night that Trump got COVID. I obviously got back on for the election. Um, I got back on ar around the Gaza stuff, but I was mostly able to stay completely off of it. But then for some stories, like I wrote that Britney Spears story with Ronan and mm -hmm. I had to check Twitter a lot because I had to, you know, like follow certain things. And I got, I, I, don't, I guess I have to admit that I'm re-addicted. I get, I log on every day now for like, Oh. Yeah. Oh, for no, like they a got minute. you. You're back. <laughs> I'm back. I log on probably every day, never for more than like a minute. But it's it's back. And I have no desire to say anything. But it's it's exactly what you were saying. It's like, what are people talking about? I mean, <laughs> and like, I, what's going I, on? <laughs> I, I've had a theory. I don't think this is like a, a very original theory, but that it, the pandemic has made it all worse, like much, much worse. Of course. Because yeah. we have it has just forced us all online. And then like the only escape we usually have, which is like going out and seeing people in person and socializing and talking to new people. And, and saying to friends. things to the people we should be saying it to. Right, and yeah, exactly. <laughs> Working out our thoughts in conversation like humans do. Yeah. Um, that hasn't been possible. And I think it's not just affecting us individually, but I think it's made like civic life worse. I think it's made Absolutely. politics worse. And it is sort of like the, like the boiling frog <laughs> story right like that we we might not have noticed it at first and it's sort of been an understated thing during the pandemic but like one of the reasons everyone is so pissed off lately is because we've been spending all this time online and and not with yeah. not with each other it's like it's five years of internet use all crammed into the last 18 months like it's yeah. the same it's it's the level of you know, I, I think it, it also is we see what our social interaction is like when its primary mediation is not, you know, because one of the reasons it's so easy to why it's so much harder to door to door canvas than to like send people to the right places to donate or whatever. And because there's friction. Right. And we forget how we're not meant to have most of our communication be through mediums that are making five companies a huge amount of money. Like we're meant to be unmonitored and just saying things to each other right and not to not to everyone all at once publicly right i mean it's so interesting you, you made the point about the friction when you're going door-to-door -door canvassing and like in my former life i was a speech writer and so i tried to help barack obama write words that would persuade people and i thought okay maybe you could persuade people and i thought that at first that twitter was a place where you could like have debates and persuade people and work things out. But the more I did that, you realize like, as you try to persuade an individual, what you'd say to one individual to persuade them isn't what you'd necessarily say to someone else. And then someone else jumps in your mentions and suddenly you're in this bad fight and it's terrible. And I think what it's done over the last several years, especially today is it is, um, people think that like being right is enough. Like no one's even trying to persuade other people anymore because when you spend time on these platforms, you know, you have a really good idea what people who think just like you think. I, I know how online liberals think. I'm pretty good about that. I also know how like, like Trumpy MAGA people online think because I spend a lot of time seeing them on Twitter. But I don't know how most of the rest of the country thinks because they're not sitting there on Twitter broadcasting their thoughts all the time. And the truth is a lot of them have like some pretty complicated thoughts about a whole bunch of different issues. And if we saw that more, we would probably work harder to persuade people. But instead we think, you know what, everyone's already made up their minds. And so I'm just like, like being right is enough. And I think that if we have yeah. the mindset that being right is enough and that we're not supposed to be persuading people, then that makes democracy pretty difficult. Yeah, and also like the I even let alone being enough, I I think that in the absence of satisfying civic involvement, people uh, you know will settle for it being pleasurable. But I don't even think it is. No. Like I think that's why I wrote that. Like you know the, the idea that we're overvaluing our opinions. It's like my job for a while was literally to like write what I thought about things. But I was like, this is like like I. The pleasure that I got from it was clear, like the only pleasure I've ever gotten from writing is like understanding something a little better privately. Like the idea that the, the I don't think there's any pleasure in being right at all. Like it, it's like, so what? Then what? Right. What the fuck are you going to do? It's, you know, the same like, kinda, like could, it's the same kind of dopamine hit that you get from the Internet, right? Like it's a, it's a brief fleeting moment when you hit that tweet that you think you're, you're right about something. You're like, yeah, 
yeah, I told them I was right. And then it goes away and you're like, okay, well, what did I get from that? So I think that our kids are like a few weeks apart. Um, yeah, when was yours born again? Uh, he was July 23rd. Cool. Uh, what about yours? August 7th. Yeah, Emily's due date was originally August 9th, so very close. Um, has that affected the way you see these problems with the internet, given that like this is how our children are, are, are going to grow up into the world? Well, well, now I really want to know what can I, has it has it changed the way you think about the internet? Has it changed the way you think about work? It has affected me, particularly over the last several months. So, like you know, yeah. Charlie was born. Why in particular? He's like a, He's yeah. like a little alien, you know, and, and you're like just trying yeah. to keep him alive. Right. And then we get to like seven or eight months and suddenly then you start seeing the personality. Right. And he is this just joyful, happy kid. And he's now he's a toddler and he's bounding around and he's starting to talk, you know, and I'm just I, I watch him and I'm like, he's so happy being like undistracted by any internet or screens or all this kind of stuff and I, I, I was it made me think of like what it was like to be a child without all of the distractions of modern life that mainly come from the internet now and as I watch him and you know I'm doing this series so I guess it's on my mind anyway but I start thinking to myself like oh how long until he is just like has a phone and is hooked on these screens and is part of this world and there's mm -hmm. just this innocence now at this age Mm -hmm. that um, I sort of, I, I worry will go away once the, once the screens really come into play. But does he also already know that phones are special? Because, like, <laughs> like, Paloma, like, really knows that the phone is special. <laughs> really? It's, oh, yeah. Like, in I what mean, way? Like, if, if it's like, she'll, like, crawl over to the couch and be like, mine, you know? And I'm like, no, get the book. <laughs> yeah, I, I do think about a lot, like, it's always been really, really obvious to me that the internet was a source of pleasure, but there were a, there was a, a real set of things in real life that were always more pleasurable. Like mm. reading a really good book was always more pleasurable. Going like partying with my friends, like eating dinner, walking the dog, like getting high and like just looking at people, you know, like it was always, <laughs> it, it, they, they were all, you know, going out, like it's, it was always more pleasurable to me and and they were things that held my attention, that, that could keep my attention, that could rescue me from what the internet does to my attention and to my sense of the world, which is like chop it up and make me feel terrible. Yeah. And I am so glad that I spent a lot of childhood reading books for six hours, you know, running around outside for six hours straight. You know, I said, I'm glad that I spent so much time as an adolescent partying, <laughs> you know, whatever. Like you, because I, I, I gained access to things that were so self-evidently more pleasure, pleasurable than anything you get through a screen as yeah. much as I, and I, and that is, that's been how I think about it vis-a-vis -vis Paloma. Like, I mean, the dream is that she becomes some sort of Luddite, like, you know, <laughs> like, fuck you, mom. Like, you know, the world that you guys built is garbage and I want to be like a communitarian farmer and blow up pipelines, you know, like that's my dream for her. But, um, but my true hope is that she's able to find real life more pleasurable than this and, and and the friction and the danger of it right and the the opportunities for discomfort and and the lack of slickness and the the inconvenience and the confusion and the surprise of real life yeah i want her to find it more physically pleasurable than the internet mm. and then maybe that'll help when they're you know hooked up to their chips in 20 years right and like blogging <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> no i think that's right I, i've thought that too as i've been like reading Charlie bedtime stories. And then I've gone from reading him bedtime stories to like just telling him stories and making them up, like trying to get him to sort of use his create, you know, be more creative, be more present, have more conversations that aren't based on like seeing something or watching a screen or stuff like that, like that, mm -hmm. it, you know, we might be able to avoid it a little bit um, in, in the way we raise them. Um, you've talked a lot about how you sort of wrote trick mirror to clarify your own thinking like you really wrote it for yourself and yet it became this book that was a, a bestseller on tons of bestseller lists best book lists barack obama puts it on his uh 2019 you know favorite book list um do you do you get some sense of hope from the fact that at the very least like this struck a chord with so many people 
who all sort of recognized, yeah, this is a problem. I, I actually identify with this problem, that maybe the awareness of how awful the internet is and why it's so awful is a first step towards something. I don't know what. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I still really haven't accepted or understood it, but I, I, I did feel, and I feel really lucky, especially like being in bookstores, you know, with a bunch of other people and feeling that we were all in search of the same thing together, like exactly together, you know, that, and, and feeling like I had no answers from them. All I could do was like try to give them a map of one version of the problem, you know? Mm, yeah. But it's interesting that the, I, I've never articulated this thought to myself even. So it's, it's interesting thinking about this now. The book even, in itself became a representation of something that it wasn't, right? Like it, it got swallowed into the mechanisms of the internet that I wrote about, right? Like people Instagrammed yeah. it, you know, next to their succulents. You know, and again, like it was like that I, you know, West Elm used it in a freaking, you know, really? like furniture ad. And I was like, yeah. You're like, and <laughs> you're like, great. <laughs> but being in the same room with people that were asking, that were, you know, we were all there to ask the same questions really of each other, right? Like not even of me, they were there to ask it of the people around them. That felt incredible. I mean, th this is the, the starting ground for everything good that's ever gonna happen in the future is being physically in a room with other people and ready to work it out, you know? Uh, last question, I'm asking all our guests. Uh, what's your favorite thing to do to completely unplug and how often do you get to do it? I wanna plug internet things that there was there was one internet thing that I did all throughout the pandemic. Did you did you know that website that would show you out other people's windows? No. It's called Window Swap. No, that's it was I amazing. Heard of it. I still, yeah, I really love like aquarium cams and stuff, and like like little like walks through forests and stuff like on YouTube. <laughs> but there's this place called Window Swap, and you can just look out someone else's window, and you know anywhere in the world at any time of, and it just it gives you a new one. It's like chat roulette, but for nature and no penises, and it's just so pleasurable. Good use of technology. I like that. That's great. Yeah. Um, the honestly, like any, like, <laughs> um, this is like kind of a gro like I'm like drugs but like the thing that gets me <laughs> away from screens for longest is like doing mushrooms you know and oh yeah I made my triumphant return post baby recently and I was like oh yeah here we go this is the good <laughs> stuff <laughs> I get it. um Gia Tolentino thank you so much for uh for being the first guest here in offline oh my god I'm the first you're the first. You're the pilot episode. This is the. This Holy is it. This shit. is the pilot. You're kicking it wow. all off. Wow! 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 <laughs> Thank you so much. I really <laughs> it appreciate it. It was lovely this. to talk to you. You too. Take care.